Welcome to the official tennis.com podcast featuring professional coach and community leader, Kamal Murray. Welcome to the tennis.com podcast. I am your host, Kamal Murray, and we are here with the legend, somebody I've had the privilege of coaching against when he was coaching Coco Vandeweghe. He sent me home packing early uh, from a couple tournaments. Uh, a former number four in the world. And I never forget that number because one of my good friends, Zena Garrison, I always say, yeah, you were top 10 in the world. And she says, I was number four, right? <laughs> so, so she always gives me the specific number. So Pat, you shared that number with Zena, uh, number six in the world in doubles, which I remember because my other good friend, Chanda Rubin was number six. So those two numbers, I never forget your, your all-time highs. Uh, but you won Wimbledon in 1987. And yes, that was the year I started playing tennis. I started playing tennis 7 27, 1987. Yeah, Good. Yeah. Makes me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got a story about, about your age, too. I'm going to save that one for later. But oh, dear. If, 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 eight, 19, if TikTok was around in 1987, you'd be trending because right. you did something that all these young bucks don't even know where it came from. You won Wimby. You hop into the player's box, and ever since then, it's a thing. So much of a thing that now they have a ladder sponsor at the U.S. Open to help the player Warner Ladders, right? To help the player climb up to the player box. (laughs) I love it. Now when they're building new stadiums, they're like, okay, we need a, a, a gate and a stairwell from the player box to the court so the players don't hurt themselves climbing up on the the, uh, the geraniums and the planters, all because of you. Uh. <laughs> so, so tell us about that day and what sparked you to do that. You obviously didn't know you were going to be setting a trend that would last for 50 years. But tell us about that moment. No, no I, I just thought it would be... Uh... I thought it'd be cool. I, I just thought it, I, the, the bottom, the bottom line was, is that, um, you know, I was uh, there, I was 22. I'd, uh, you know, playing Wimbledon. I'd won Davis cup from, for Australia um, t- a couple of times already. I was, so I was a young, at the time I was the youngest ever to play in a Davis cup final, a winning Davis cup final um, in Australia. I was 19 or just, was I 19? Yeah, maybe just 19 or, um, you know, I, and, I, and I, you know, I felt I had a chance to, to, you know, to win the a, a big uh, a big title at some stage, um, and then I had a you know I had a bad. Look, I'm not going to go through my whole life history, but uh, you know I had a back injury. I was out for about a year. Uh, during that time, my girlfriend got pregnant, and I was there. I was a coming a father at the age of 20 with my career. You know, uh, they were warned off that uh, you know they don't know if I'm going to be able to come back from this back injury. It was a bad herniated disc with pressure on the nerves and whether they needed extra surgery, all this sort of stuff. You know. Um, anyway, I, I just I managed to and I got a fantastic team and support team around me, and um, including my my parents. Um, I think one of the toughest things I ever had to do was tell my dad that my girlfriend was pregnant. Uh, being a strict Catholic family, uh, that didn't necessarily go down all that well um but uh you know as a you know as a great family they are they you know full full support um i had, i got a, had a great coach ian barclay was my coach since i was age 12 he was always there for me and i got picked up a great trainer physical trainer called uh, dr ann quinn uh yes i had a female trainer um which was really weird so i had a <laughs> <laughs> Nobody had ever seen a female around a men's uh, anywhere near a men's locker room back in those days or a yeah. gym. Not that they had gyms in those. They didn't really have warm-up gyms. We were all on the side and she was running around. They're like, who's this woman that's hanging out with you? So, you know, uh, <laughs> they, you know there was, that was just the way it was. Um, so I had this great team. Uh, went through, we'd been through a few mini crises already in a, in a short career. And, you know, that was my way of thanking them. You know, when I, when I won... Um, and I only really thought about it properly the night before. Uh, it came, popped into my head for whatever reason in, you know, a few months before. And, uh, and I said, you know, when I win Wimbledon this year, I'm going to climb up through the stands and thank, and thank my, fa- thank my family that they deserve that. 
Um, and no, that's, that's it. I didn't think about it until the night before. And I was sitting there watching Charles Bronson movie, um, uh, Death Wish, I think. Or I don't know. what. Uh, no, Murphy's Law. I think Murphy's Law it was called. Um, Charles Bronson blowing away some bad guys, you know, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, trying to relax uh, and, and visualizing every single thing. So I did a lot of visualization and a great sports psycholo psych psychologist with me as well, Olympic trainer guy called Jeff Bond. Um, so I assembled this, this team, which people were thinking, who the hell are all these people? Um, there was a first team. There was a first team of uh, a trainer. These weren't full-time, but they were, they were as full-time as I could afford. Yeah, uh, full-time coach, part-time tra physical trainer, part-time sports psychologist. I string out there on in my in the box with me as well. And that was like, I mean, now it's commonplace. Back then they were like, they literally wimbled and said, no, you cannot have these people. Who are they? Well, they're my team. Oh, no, you cannot have a team of more than two people, one or two people. That's it. You got your, your father and your girlfriend. That's it. And my father being a lawyer managed to negotiate his way to, to half a dozen tickets and, and got everybody in there. But they never heard of it. They never heard of the players box before players team. It was right. a coach and maybe a support a manager. And that was about it. So about, my way right. of th thanking them was that was to thanking these great people. And I felt like, and you know what it's like, um, uh, you know, it is a team, it's a team effort. And it might, and it was way of me thanking that team. Um, you know, I had to do the hard work, but boy, do they do a lot of hard work as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was my way of thanking them and, and um, it became uh, pretty famous for it. I think, almost more famous for the fact that I got stuck halfway and couldn't get my way up there. <laughs> the royal family were raiding. Princess Diana was there and the Duchess of, oh my God, I always get it wrong if it's Gloucester or, uh, um, I keep forgetting which Duchess is now, what was, was then. Um, but I kept the royal family waiting. So I got a big slap on the wrist from that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now yeah, that the, the chairman came up to me afterwards and said, Pat, we really enjoyed that. that was something, a real special moment, but you have to promise me never to do that again. All right. I kept the royal family waiting. And, and you're like, I hope happened. I have the chance to do it again. Right. Get, get back That's exactly what I was. That's what I was thinking. I never got the chance. I never got the chance. Was the next year, there? Martina Navratilova did it. Next year, Martina did it and jumped through the stands. And he <laughs> sort of looked at me and went, I didn't talk to Martina about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, was the chairman Philip Brook at the time? No, no, it was Buzzer Haddingham. Um, so, yeah, there was, there was many, well, you know, it's, gee, it's uh, 35 years ago now. Oh, what, are, what are we? 30, uh, yeah, 35 years this, this year. Uh, so it's amazing how time flies. But, uh, you know, that was a, a different club then, back different era and different type of courts, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. The balls were quick, courts were fast. Uh, you know, it was um, it was a fast and dry court in those in those days, particularly at the end of the tournament. Um, it was getting chopped up where the serve volleyers were. So you used to, you know, when you needed a, a point, you used to serve down the middle and just hope for a bit of a bad bounce. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you're really tight, you just hit that ball, try and hit it into the, into the, into the foot marks there and hope that you get a bad bounce. And that often happened. Um, so you think about something else, well, now they're fully ready for it, right? I mean, like now they have cameras in the player box, like these rotating cameras. Now there's like five cameras on the court, camera one through five. And one of those cameras pans to the player box almost after every point to get the player box reaction. I mean, you really created the narrative, right? So now it's not just the tennis that's going on. It's the narrative. Who's sitting there? Who's the coach? Who's the trainer? How long they've been together? Who's the dad? Who's the mom? There's the boyfriend, right? Now it's like a whole narrative of a match, not just the tennis. And that is all because of you. And I don't know if people- No, know. I, I, I oh, look, look, that's, I don't know if that's kind of you to say that, but I think, I think it's sort of, in the real professional era came, I think it sort of started around the Borg era. I mean, because Borg, had Leonard Berglund there as his coach and his mentor, and he's always the ice cold and his girlfriend. And then, and then in McEnroe, Jimmy Connors, of course, had his had his wife Patty. Or I, actually, that's that's at various stages. They had Chris Evert in the box, of course. They were going out, <laughs> and that was when all of a sudden it became quite glamorous, wasn't it? Oh my goodness, Jimmy Connors and Chris Evert. <laughs> you know, she's in the box. They're cheering him on, and then there was, you know, then there was you know Borg and how did how who is this man that is 
got Bjorn Borg to win, you know, five French and six Wimbledons in a row or, you know, whatever it happened to be. Um, you know, he's an Iceman. Who is this mystery coach, you know? So the, the, the interest that was created by an individual player and a coach as, as opposed to back before me, it was, you know, the Davis Cup team or Harry Hotman's team or, or whoever it happened to be. It was, it was more of a team and, and less individuals. But it started becoming individuals just as I sort of say, came on the circuit. And, uh, uh, yeah, I, bet, I, I suppose I'm, I'm to blame for all the, the lack, lack, lack of tickets that, that <laughs> the tennis <laughs> corners have now. <laughs> uh, it's, it's still hard to get tickets at Wimbledon. I mean, damn, unless you're a Final Eight club, I mean, good luck, right? Yeah, yeah no but, kidding. Um, but you, you got to use another trend, the bandana. Uh, you were the yeah. first dude to take his bandana, throw it in the stands, and now yeah. you see all these boys, Rublev, Tissipas, Demidrov, all, they, they grow their hair long, so when they pull the bandana back, it, it looks good, and it's nice and sweaty, and they're chucking it in the stands all nice and sweaty. Have yeah. no, I don't know that they even know that that will come from. Even now, you got people who don't wear a bandana, Francis Tiafo. He don't wear a bandana, so he just takes off his shirt and throws it in, right? That that's like the pack cash effect. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, again, it was just it's it's amazing what influences you as you grow up. I remember as a as a kid, a couple of incidences. And this is like this is talk about going full circle. When I was a kid, and I was just talking about this yesterday, as I met the guy, he was the head coach at Kuyong Tennis Club, which oh, is yeah. where the home of Australian Open was. A guy called Jeff. Glenn Busby. And Glenn Busby played um, a match, Victorian hard Victorian championships against a guy called Peter McNamara, who you you know, the Peter, Peter, one of the Super Max. And I was a kid, I was one of the top juniors, and they asked me, could I ball boy? So I ball boy for the semi-final and the final, and these guys played each other in the final, in the, in the semi-final or final. Anyway, Peter McNamara gave me his wristband. And I just thought that was the coolest thing of all time. Peter McNamara <laughs> gave me his wristband. And of course, Peter went on to win. Be top ten singles player, uh, win a couple of win a couple of friend uh, Wimbledon's with with Paul McNamee called the Super Max. They were massive stars. They used to play at Kuyong on the court one or centre court. People would sit there for an hour waiting for them, full out, full stadium, waiting for the doubles team to come out. Can you imagine what that would happen now? I mean, maybe the Bryan brothers. There'd be people wanting to see them, but you know that's that's how big the t- tennis was back in Australia. And funny enough, Peter and I. Um, uh, grew up, started our first tennis lesson in the same little three, two court ch- uh, Catholic school. We had the same lesson in the same place. We ended up being Davis Cup buddies, and I'm coaching his girl now. Now Peter, Peter has passed away, um, unfortunately, sadly, and he coached uh, China's uh, Wang Chiang, and now I, I've been coaching her for the last year. Um, and, and he coached Philippoussis, and I coached Mark Philippoussis after him. And ah. So it's it's amazing. Peter and I have had this bond for for a lo- for a long time. But um, yeah, and it's uh, so he gave me his wristband, and I always remember that as a kid. It's, it's so in, so in, in, in parts this impression on you. And I always so I thought, you know, I'm going to give my wristbands out, my headbands out to the kids because they they're the fans, they're the ones that cheer you on, you know. And mm-hmm. and one of the one of the things that always irritates me. Um, it's funny because I've often said. I don't like the idea of players blowing kisses to the crowd and everything when they win. I, you you got to be, you got to be modest and you got to, you know, and, and walk off the court or let their opponent walk off the court um, first or whatever it happened to be. And, and then and I think you got to be modest. I mean, it's, I don't know, Agassi brought in this sort of blowing kissing stuff and, right. and so did Chiara. <laughs> Why don't they blow kisses to their fans when they lose? Their fans were still cheering for them when they lost. Shouldn't you still right, be right. kisses to your fans when you, if you lost? You know, look, I lost, but I love you. I Right. You know, instead of storming off, it's like, oh, you, you be mad, yeah. you love, right? Yeah, yeah, what about my fans? You know, uh, right? <laughs> so, uh, you try, you treat your fans, you try, you treat your fans as well as you can, but you know, obviously, you, you, there's many a grumpy mood when you're, when you're when you're a tennis player, yeah. So, you set that trend now. One last one I want to touch on it, it is what became known as Super Saturday, yeah. Now, Super Saturday at the U.S. Open, you and Lindell had five sets. Chris and Martina, 
came behind you with three sets. And Johnny Mack and Connors had another five set. And that mm-hmm. became the, the day at the U.S. Open, right? Yeah. I mean, that, first of all, that was a long-ass day of tennis. But well, that well. became like the day at the Open. If you got to get tickets, you got to get it to Super Saturday. Tell me about that day. Yeah, well, it became known as Super Saturday, the original Super Saturday. Um, of course, those days, the U.S. Open semifinals for the men were on the Saturday and the final was on the Sunday, which is brutally hard for the guys. <laughs> Um, and then the women's mat, women's final in between. I mean, that was for TV. They had the big TV rights and uh, whoever it was, CBS or NBC, I don't know who it was, but uh, they said, yeah, we're going to pay big money, but we want everything on the weekend. Um, so uh, that just happened to be, I'm not sure it was one of the first ones or just the best one, but yeah, it started off actually even before that when Stan Smith beat John Newcomb seven or six, four or seven, five in the third in the Legends event. We came on, I had match point on Linda, lost seven, six in the fifth, having match point. You had a fantastic lob over my head on match point. Uh, yeah, Chris, uh, Martina came out and beat, beat, beat Chris Ever, I think uh, seven, five in the, in the third, going right down to the last wire. And then just to finish it off, the biggest rivals of all time, hated rivals. Uh, Mac beat Jimmy Connors, uh, seven, five in the fifth. It was 12 hours of nonstop tennis. And it was, I was the under. I was the only unknown then. I was a 19-year-old sort of brash Aussie guy. I got to the semi-final of Wimbledon, and I played one of the matches of my life. And uh, yeah, it became known as um, as Super Saturday, the greatest tennis day of all time. And uh, it's it's still regarded as the greatest tennis day of all time. I mean, it's, you just don't have that anymore. You just don't have semi-finals and finals <laughs> on on the same same time anymore. So it was just one of those crazy days. And uh, the crowd were going nuts, and um, I was I was really excited to be part of. I was really disappointed to lose, of course. Um, but when I woke up in the morning, and I thought, "Oh my God! Imagine if I had to play John McEnroe today." And five and the next day, right? The next day, and it's funny enough, I saw Mac and Mac and I used to get on pretty well because we used to love a guitar, and and we still get on well. I mean, but we used to hang out a lot because in those days, you know, I had as I said, I had a little team, but by and large, you had one coach and. You, to travel so we used to travel with our guitars half the time and Peter Scarolitis used to travel with his guitar and we used to sort of try and learn some songs and go to see some rock bands and whatever and and afterwards Mac said to me uh he, came, he literally came to me he said Matt I gotta thank you for 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 my US Open win I'm like what are you talking about <laughs> he said I was absolutely exhausted I came into the to the locker room and I was thinking, how am I supposed to beat Lendl? He's the Iron Man. How am I supposed to beat him? Right. And I looked across the locker room and Lendl couldn't bend down to, to get to put his bag in the locker. He had to, he's trying to, it took him about five minutes to sort of shuffle his body around and then he ended up giving it to the coach to put his bag or something in the locker. He said, oh my God, Lendl's worse than me. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was, yeah, you beat funny. him up. He beat, and he beat him up. He beat him up. Uh, you know, when, when McEnroe, you got to be really sharp when you're playing McEnroe because he is so accurate, so accurate with his shots. I mean, it was, if you were really quick, uh, you could get to them and, and stay in the rallies. But he was just so, he just hit line after line and slide the ball away. And if you were tired, he, he was a horror. You'd just be, he'd be Especially in New York. Yeah, in New York, exactly. And yeah. New York, man. And fast courts, fast courts. So you play in the era where you got, you all start to really take it to a different level. There was still a lot of serving volley, but there started to be this personality, this Super Saturday with Connors and everybody started to have celebrities sort of show up. Yeah, like Connors, McEnroe, Becker, Ed Bird, Pern Force. Tony, yeah. Who in that group were you like, damn, I don't want to play them? Yeah. Um... You know, being a serve and volley, uh, any any time there was a remotely slow court and you had to play, uh, yeah, one of the Swedes, Edberg aside, because um, he was an attacking player, it would be it'd be like, oh dear, this is going to be a long day. Um, you know, uh, Brad Gilbert was always a nasty one. You knew he was just going to fight away, but you know, Brad didn't have a, you didn't have a massive game, so you knew you could get sort of get on top of. It. But but yeah, guys like Pernfors, but I. I you know, Lendl brought in the big hitting. There is no doubt about it. He brought in the power, the power game. Uh, he had, you know, the, the European technique 
uh, where he just wind up on those forehands. Um, and but he could do on the backhand. He had a big serve. I mean, people think, oh, he's got a big forehand, a big backhand. Yeah, he did. I mean, you should watch some old YouTube stuff of him hitting forehands. <sighs> um, but he had a big first serve. His second serve was a little bit shaky, so you could get on top of that uh, at times. But he, he brought that in. And I think the person that, that made took it to the next level was Becker. I mean, he just, and, and I've got to say to this day, and even though I kind of, I don't mind admitting it now because uh, Boris and I get on pretty well, but to say that I'd say Becker was the toughest player I ever played, um, uh, it wouldn't have been something I would like to admit but back, back in the day. I mean, it, the toughest, I'll tell you why, because you're never safe with Boris. He had enormous power. I mean, we know, he boom, boom. I mean, he could just blow aces by it. He could right. just hit winners off forehand and backhand. Uh, and he and he was diving all over the net. He was a very very good volleyer and a very good athlete, fiercely competitive. Um, you know, a bit of an a bit of an a hole. You know, I, I, I don't mind. There was plenty of those guys out there. We're all we're all extreme competitors. We're all in each other's faces. And and Boris was tough. He was a tough competitor. But you never felt safe. You'd have a, have a set and a break or set and two breaks or or whatever. And then he could just go. You relax and just hit three, you know, three winners straight past you off your first serve. Boom, 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 smash. So three aces, bang, bang, bang. And he'd back on top and win the match. And you'd be like, what the, what the hell happened then? You know, I was all over this guy. It was, you know, um, so you never felt safe anywhere. Me, I never felt safe anywhere on the court, wherever I hit the ball against Boris. You just, you just didn't know. I mean, the most fiercest competitors, talented, you know, I, it's just very hard to go past McEnroe um, as far as shot making. Uh, it just a, just ridiculous as I've discussed. Edberg, McEnroe, the best volleyers I've ever seen. Uh, Edberg's backhand was just outrageously good. Um, but you know, and, and I joked with Matt's Villander about this just the other day. Actually, uh, Matt's was just absolute rock. I mean, talk about a guy you don't want to play when you're not feeling particularly well. Uh, Matt's would never ever give you a free point. Uh, he just he just wouldn't. He just and he'd pass you and lob you like, like you weren't there. But, uh, you know, I said to, you know, we talked about the Australian Open final because I lost to, him, to Edberg at Kuyong. Mm-hmm. And the last time I was on grass and I lost the first one to Matt's the next year, uh, both, both in five sets. Um, heartbreaker, six, what, six, three or six, four in the fifth against Edberg. I went down and then eight, six in the fifth um, against, against Villander. So we had a good chat about it on a, on a, on a chat show. And, and we said, look, we both agreed. We said, if you get to Stefan Edberg, you get, all you have to do is give him three high forehands and you'd, you'd win the point or three or four. And he, we said, you couldn't get him three high forehands. He was in the net every time. <laughs> he'd hit the first forehand and he'd crunch it and he'd get in the net. You, you just couldn't get him to hit three high forehands. You know that that was kind of hooky forehand up there. But he was so fast and, and uh, so athletic. So he protected his weakness. Um, uh but, you know, then, then, there's the, then there's the modern era, of course, there's Agassi and Sampras and, you know, Ivanisevic and these guys, which I caught at the end of my career, which uh, was not a lot of fun when you're just a little bit slow, slower around the court. Um, but, you know, Jimmy Connors as a competitor, I always modeled myself, not modeled myself, but modeled my attitude on Jimmy Connors, Bjorn Borg, and then tactics of John McEnroe. And I just thought that was just a great combination. Um, and I, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I, for me, that worked. That really worked. Well, you talk about people getting into the net. Like, after your career was over, you went on the coach, right? Which And these two people made total sense because of the way you played, the way they played. Philip Hussis, Greg Ruzetsky, that was like the last of a dying breed, right? Just there are not any pure serving volleyers on tour right now, right? Courts too – I mean – Courts are too slow. It's just the game has sort of evolved. Like every time you say Koo Young with a positive history, now I look at Koo Young as like, we couldn't get a court uh, on Melbourne Park. You couldn't get a court at NTC. They send you to Koo Young, right? <laughs> so Koo Young is like the dungeon now, where back then it was like the mainstay. Yeah. But you had the opportunity to go and coach uh, those guys who are the last number, but then you had a chance to watch a Coco, uh, to coach Coco Vandeweghe and Nakashima. Coco, to me, tons of firepower, really talented. To me, will be, if she doesn't win a Grand Slam, will be one of the best American players. 
not to win a slam. I remember 2017 when Sloan won the slam. Coco got to the semis. I was like, ooh. And, and in the five or six years I coached Sloan, we've never beat Coco. Mm-hmm. We were like praying for Coco to lose in that semi. It was like, if she gets <laughs> to the, I was like, oh, man, we, we yeah. need Madison to beat her real bad, right? She, she did. What, was it, what was it like coaching Coco? Because I know Kyle, you know, her boyfriend Kyle, I'm like, oh, Kyle, you poor man. She rough. She's, she's a lot of fun, but I know she is at home whooping your ass. You know, I was like, what's it like coaching Coco? She, she's actually a really fun girl. She, I mean, yeah. she's a really lovely girl. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we got on great. We had a lot of fun. Um, I think she, you know, we, uh, it was my job to, to, to bring some elements to her game, bring it to a new level, discipline, all that sort of stuff. And, and I think we did that pretty well. Um, you know, we had a great run that that year. Uh, you know, Madison Keys. You know, we got them, her and Maddie played each other three times that summer. Uh, and I joined up with Coco just before Wimbledon, and uh, I remember her her losing in the the sixteens um, to uh, Ribrakova. Ribrakova is that what um, Yeah, yeah, and and. Coco was furious, but I saw all these things I needed to change in her game, but I couldn't change them in the middle of the grass court season, right? So right. you don't, you can't do that. And Coco came in and uh, into the, the cool down area and I could see her just steaming. And then she just grabbed her three of her rackets and started walking, running out of the, running out of the <laughs> hugging. I go, they, they, she's going to demolish these rackets. She was, pretty good. <laughs> she was good at it. Um, <laughs> and I just grabbed her. I said, Coco, come back here. I said, Coco. Tomorrow, you said, tomorrow we're on the practice court. You're going to change a lot of things. You said, you cannot be consistent with X, A, B, and C in your game. Right. I'm, I'm being really brutal now. We couldn't, we did it as well as we could. I said, this is just the start. Put those damn rackets back. You're going to need them tomorrow morning to practice. So I'm not practicing tomorrow morning. I said, yes, you bloody are. <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes, you are. Yeah. You're practicing tomorrow morning. And I got her out of bed. We went in the indoor courts there and she practiced. And I said, this is what we're going to do. This and this and this on your serve and this and this. She said, thank you for getting me out. I would normally, I'd have just smashed my rackets, got drunk and been miserable for three days. I said, right, well, if you want to be a top player, you got to be disciplined. And her and Maddie ended up with playing three, three. We get to the US, they play each other in the final of, uh, of Stanford. Uh, they play each other first round the next week in Cincinnati. Uh, Maddie, that was the first two matches were really tight, and then uh, and then Madison played unbelievable in the semi final. We really, I really thought just for a second, and this is the big mistake, as you know, just for a second, I thought, my God, she can win this tournament. <laughs> so, I know, right? And you never want to think that, even if even if you're no. thinking it, you like you like slap yourself, say, stop thinking it, right? Yeah, 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 and 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 uh, you know, we're thinking. You know, get past me. I know it's a big match, but gee, Coco's playing even better than the last time. And Madison played absolutely unbelievable tennis. I mean, you almost want to pull that up and go, this is how Coco didn't, didn't do much wrong. I mean, she's a little tentative, nervous to start, of course. And Madison just said, well, winner after winner after winner after winner. I said, oh my God, I've never, I've never seen anybody, a woman play that way. I never, mm-hmm. that, 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 that level. I mean, Serena, okay, but against somebody that good. Uh, and I thought, geez, she's going to, and then Sloan's a different ball game, just a different player. And that was fascinating, fascinating. I, I walked away and said, oh, Maddie's going to, she's going to, she's got the title done. But yeah. a whole different ball game playing somebody with a different game than, than Coco and, and Sloan. And that was, uh, that was really interesting to see. So, yeah, Co- and then right off the back of that, um, yeah, she went off and, of course, played a Fed Cup and, and was a Fed Cup star, Coco. We, we, that was, I said, what do you want to do? She says, I want to play, I want to, I want to win Fed Cup for my country. And she was always about that. I want to play, represent my country, and I want to play the Olympics. And I said, okay, well, let's win the Fed Cup then. And we, that was our motivation. And Coco's up and down a little bit uh, with her motivation. And we kept that going. And I remember her going out to Moscow and uh, she had to play, they had to play Belarus. Bella, yeah, Bella, Bella, Belarus. It was Belarus. Belarus, yeah. And uh, as a ranker, wasn't in the team then, uh, but they had um, Sasnovich uh, and Sasnovich. Zabalenka. Zabalenka and uh, Zabalenka was just coming through. Yeah. And I went to Moscow. I was grumpy, pretty much sort of through that match. And I grabbed her and I said, "You realize these girls are sitting in Belarus? They're practicing with these guys. 
they are kick, going to kick your ass if you're at with that attitude. I said, they are going to kick your ass. Said, they are waiting for you. You are going to blow your biggest opportunity. I said, I want you top 10 and I want you to win the Fed Cup. That's what we want. And we got it to top 10. And then she went off and uh, I said, come to London. We're going to work our ass off with 10 days before we go to Belarus. Belarus. Uh, and uh, she did it. She did it. So there were the two of the three goals we aimed for. And um, and then off the back of that, we had a great preseason. She hurt her foot, had this bad ankle, and she got this horrendous, horrendous thing called chronic regional pain syndrome. I don't know if you know anything about this, but Coco's had bad ankles, kept twisting them, and uh, twisted it again uh, along the way that year. And then in preseason, she jammed her toe and just cracked the cartilage in her big toe. We didn't, she didn't know much about it. She said, oh, I just jammed my toe and the foot just blew up. And what the brain has done, and this is phantom, phantom limb. I mean, we know, maybe not might know as phantom limb when people have had this dead arm or dead limb and it's so painful that they actually, in the past, they used to cut it off and they could still feel the pain. I said, but how can you feel the pain? You haven't got the arm left. The hand's not there. Right. It's the same thing. It's because the brain has sent a pattern to lock down that limb because it keeps getting injured. So the brain goes, no, nah, you're not using it ever again. That's it. And her foot was swollen. She couldn't touch it. It was sensitive. It was burning nonstop for months. And with, as luck would have it, my one of my trainers said, she's got a pain syndrome. Remember that video I sent you about, it's probably something to do with that. I looked through it and there's an old video she sent me from this guy from Australia who was a specialist in this chronic regional pain syndrome. And I called the guy up and she he goes, oh, he gets straight away. I said, there's somebody in Stanford, there's somebody in San Diego, either one, they're great people, get onto this because every minute you go is her foot dying, it's dying, it's basically dying. And all the muscle, the tissue will waste away and uh, that'll be the end of her career. She'll ne she may not ever be able to walk properly the rest of her life. So I'm like, get up and see these people. And she worked her way through it. Um, hasn't quite been the same player since, but uh, you know, that, that was six months. It took us six months um, of just trying to put weight on it. It's, it's horrific, horrific story. But, and it's few people have recovered from that. So she's had a bit of bad luck, Coco, a lot of fun, uh, a great girl and super talented. What a ball striker. Boy, could she hit the ball. So, Oh man. It's, like, it it's been interesting. I had some talented players. Jeez. There's some good players. Philip I mean, Philip Coco. I mean, when Coco hits the ball, it's like like an airplane just took yeah. off, just a rocket ship, just like, damn, <laughs> watch out. You know what I mean? Especially off the serve and the forehand, even the backhand, backhand line, just Jesus yeah. Christ. You know, yeah, no, she could she could play. So there's, you know, as you know, mate, there's there's a lot of talent out there, and you gotta have it all. Um, I mean, the classic example is somebody like Nick Kyrgios, who's you know, you see him and you go, oh my god, this guy's one of the biggest names in tennis. What's, oh, you know, what is his, what's his record? Uh, one quarter final of a grand slam. Right. What do you mean? That's it? Yeah, that's it. You got to have it all, buddy, to win a grand slam. You got to have it all to be a successful tennis player. And if you've got gaps in your, you know, physical or personality, you know, and anybody wins a grand slam is, a, is, a, is, a, is unbelievably tough. I mean, it doesn't mean you have to you win 20, but, right. you know, and so it's, it's a tough sport out here. Gee, and the men's is tougher and tougher all the oh, time. Oh, man, the men's is leveling up. I mean, God, the women's tennis is just – anybody can win, as we know. I and mean, it's just so tough. There's so oh, many good players out there. I remember the first time uh, I saw Q. Quang Wang, well, we call it Quang Wang, right? Peter McNamara was there. 2016, Australian Open. Sloan had just won Auckland. We, we pull out of Hobart. We go straight to Melbourne. First match, first round, she draw Queen Wayne. This is before she was like a, a thing, right? We walk on the court, we book Rod Laver for a warm up. Somehow the practice desk screws it up. We got McNamara and Queen sharing the court with us two hours before the match. They play each other. Yeah. And I'm, you know, obviously I watched the girl on video before the match. I was like, ooh, this girl can play. You know what I mean? But by then she was ranked 90 in the world. No one ever knew, you know what I mean? No one ever knew her. I'm like, now this girl can play, right? And then she beat Sloan, 
first round that year, right? Coming off of a title, which is which is really common now. You see players now always win a tournament, lose first round next round, right? Next tournament. But it was like, damn, this girl can play. And I think now the world knows, to me, she's the best Chinese player. Hands down, the most talented Chinese player, small frame, good off both sides, just moves well. I mean, man, you know, just, just you, you got your hands on a good talent right there. Now, how yeah. did that come to be? How did they, because we see Spanish coaches go coach in China. You see some American coaches go coach in China. And I always wonder how they made that decision. How did that arrangement come? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, well, funny enough, I knew I knew Q, which is she's known, yeah, Chung, or we call her Q, because there's about seven Wangs on the tour. You find Wang, yeah, it's like yeah, you find there's Y, there's X, there's Q. She's known as Q. Um, uh, first of all, she's coached by Peter McNamara, who's a who I, I so I saw her. I talked to Peter on the tour. We didn't when I was coaching Coco. We didn't discuss you know, players' weaknesses or whatever, just just life in general and what she's like and all that sort of stuff. And he said, oh, she's a great girl, great girl. Um, and obviously, she, your technique was pretty good. I like that. And anyway, Peter, of course, passed away. Um, and I think Q fell, in, fell into a bit of a depression. Um, she had a decent year. I mean, two years ago, she got the fourth round here at the Australian Open and uh, beat uh, Ash Barty coming off the French Open Championship uh, at the US Open. And that was probably about it for the year. So she's up and down. Up and down to me sounds like there's either mental issue, physical. You've got to work out what the issue is, technical, physical, mental. What makes her inconsistent? Um, and I love this stuff. I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a bit of a geek in that respect, uh, technical, biomechanical analysis. It's a challenge. I mean, I love this. I love this stuff. I mean, you know, it's, it's something... It's not glamorous, as you know, as we know, the tennis is not tennis coaching is not glamorous, but it's a it's a real challenge. And uh, and basically, one of the Aussie guys who works who runs a tennis tournament uh, in China said, "Would you be?" I was working with Brandon Nakashima at the time. Be not. I really enjoyed youngsters. I enjoyed working with Brandon. I really enjoyed working with him. He's what a great kid. What a great kid. Serious talent. And uh, we were changing a few things in his technique to get him, make him a better player. Uh, well, it was last year's year before, so what are we? Uh, so twenty. And of course, the, the uh, you know the pandemic stuff hit, um, so we weren't able to get out there and play. And uh, you know, I I took a gamble with Brandon, and I said to his, you know, I said I, I like this kid. I tell you what, I'll do a reduction in my fee, um, but if he gets in the top. 80 it was a really weird deal my manager goes you sure you want to do this i said if he gets in the top 80 you can pay me back that money if you don't get there you don't have to bother about it okay so i was taking a big gamble i was taking a big pay cut but i like this kid and i like his attitude and uh and and then the pandemic happened i was like oh my god there's no chance he's gonna he barely play a tournament let alone get a top 80 but <laughs> you know i gotta i gotta stick by my deal so his mom and his manager must be going oh this is great we got one of the top coaches right. in the world we got him for like half price and he's right. no way we're gonna have to pay the rest of it i'd right. uh, so i am i you know honored my i honored it but brandon got to the stage where he couldn't really uh realistically get into the tournaments um and, you know i had to make a living so uh at, at the end of that relationship i was thinking oh you know i just this you know i gotta pay a mortgage i got kids like everybody else mm. and it's hurting brandon because he he kept saying you know they kept coming back to me going listen he's he's just still playing these challenges you know you take another reduction i'm like guys come on so it just didn't you know it wasn't fair for him it wasn't fair for me and at that time the australian guy called and said uh chiang wang's looking for a place she's had a year off in china she had the year off pandemic year covid she's pretty depressed about life, um, wants to play tennis, but doesn't know where to go. And she says, if you coach her, that she'll continue to play. And I'm like, I'd love to coach her. What a talent. First thing I did is I called Peter's widow and said, what is she like? Because you got to live with it, live with each other, don't you? I mean, 100%. you got to live with, you, you, got, you got to get the, you got the tears, you've got the anger, you've got the frustration, you've got the things go wrong. What happens when you, you screw up a practice court booking or a car booking and yeah. it happens, right? It happens. 
It happens. What's going to happen? You're going to get your head ripped off. You're going to you know, get a racket thrown. You're going to get a racket thrown at you. You're going to get a hissy fit, and she's going to throw the practice match or throw the mat or throw, throw the, the match. throw the match. Throw the or, whole match. Or just storm to the airport and leave, and then you got to find her. I mean, who knows, <laughs> right? Hundred percent. <laughs> and I'm laughing at this because I used to do this, shit, right? <laughs> I used to do this stuff, not that it necessarily my players, but I used to do it. So the uh, first thing I did is called her up and I said, what's she like? And she said, she's an absolutely fantastic girl. And I said, right, that's the most important thing. And I said, she's she's great and no problems with the management. She's an easy going, really quiet sort of girl, but works her out and really listens, really, really listens and, and pays attention. And so I came up with a game plan. I said, Q, you're inconsistent because A, B and C in my opinion. Um, uh, but first of all, I said, I, and I, first of all, I didn't say what it was. I said, you're inconsistent. What is your issues? Do you think? Why are you inconsistent? And then she said, she told me, uh, you know, she said certain things and I just basically held up a piece of paper and I went, it's exactly what I put down. This is, and I've got a couple of other things. So we're on the same page and that's what I need to know. You know, if she, if she just goes, oh, I don't know, or, you know, I disagree with you, or no, I need to work on this, then okay, we, we can work around it or discuss that. But she said exactly the same stuff. And what was, this is a, this is a classic, I joke about this, but <laughs> so I was, it was November of 20. So we're coming into the new year, looks like the tournaments are going to go on, the pandemic's easing back a little bit. Well, we thought it was. Anyway, it's another story. Um, and it's November, we want to start in December, pre-season. And I said to her, got, got on a manager who speaks very perfect English. Q's English is, is okay, but she, she hadn't practiced it for over a year and a half. And I said, how much have you, how much training have you done in the last year? And she goes, um, nothing. And I'm like, oh, okay. Um, how much tennis have you done? Uh, nothing. Oh, okay. How much gym work have you done? N nothing. I'm like, oh, sorry. So I talked to the manager. Said, sorry, I don't think she quite understands me. What, uh, what I'm, what I'm asking is, uh, you know, has she done been doing practicing? How much practicing a day or a week? And how much gym work? And has she done fit running and stuff like that? She goes, nothing. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> she has done nothing for a year. I said, nothing. I haven't been for a run. I haven't done anything. I've been depressed. I'm, I didn't want to do anything. Right. So here I am thinking, oh my God, this girl is super, superstar and whatever. And she hadn't, hadn't jogged for five minutes in a year. <laughs> so we had to start from square one. And I was like, oh my God, what have I done? Uh, but she's been fantastic. And we've had plenty of laughs. And, um, and Sometimes she's, that's better. Start from square one. Yeah. You know, we, we had to live together. We're six months, one week short of six months last year out of a suitcase together around the world, stuck in airports, Istanbul airport for three days, Miami for two extra days, stuck there. Um, I mean, the list goes on. Uh, you know, she couldn't go back to China. I couldn't go to the UK, which is where I live. So we were out wearing, the, I was wearing the same clothes I did six months before when she, when they finished the French Open. And um, she lost to Coco Goff there. She lost to Coco in the final of Parma, which is her first clay court final ever. And Coco's first 250. And she plays Coco first round here, the Australian Open. So the last three tournaments, she's and then Q went back to China and hasn't basically uh, hasn't appeared again. So uh, she won the national games there, which is important for her and her, and her country. And uh, so the last three AT WTA events she's played, she's played Coco. Uh, it it been happens six, that way, doesn't it? It, it, ha I mean, it? it just happens that way. It just, mm. you know, like uh, I remember 2017 Sloan, she played... Um, Toronto or the Montreal, Cincinnati, US Open, played Kvitova in the first two, played Safarova in the first two, played Kerber in the first two. It was like all in the same order. First round, second round, third round. First round, second round, third round. No way. Is that right? Yeah. 100%. So it, that, that's the way it happens. You know what I mean? And if you pass that test, who knows what's on the other side? No, exactly. So, Two more questions, I'll let you go. Uh, six out of the past seven years, I've spent January 26th in Australia, mm. uh, which happens to be Australia Day. And I know you've been very vocal about Australia Day and, you know, obviously as a Black person uh, and, you know, how the British kind of arrived in Australia 
and sort of took over and what that did to the people that were there. Tell us about your involvement and how you've been outspoken about Aborigines and Indigenous people uh, to Australia. Um, yeah, look, Australia Day is the day uh, uh, that the, the British landed on the January 26th was the day that Australia, the British landed in into the uh, uh, the continent of Australia. Um, now the indigenous people had been there, been there for uh, over fifty thousand years, uh, forty thousand years, forty thousand years, not forty years, forty thousand years. <laughs> uh, so uh, the British came in and said, "Right, well, this is the day that Australia was started," um, and that. Mm, okay, I, as a kid, I didn't really understand it, and I thought, okay, that's great. That's a that's a that's a day that we all celebrate. But I realised the really painful day for a majority of Indigenous people because um, uh, there's been a whole lot of trauma, um, stolen generation where the British basically compiled, gathered the Aboriginal kids, and brought them to missions. I mean, th their their intentions were what they felt was right. Um, but it was separating, separating their children from their parents. Um, they believed that their the proper education to uh, to white white make them white, uh, educate them in a white way was the right way. Even though 40,000, 50,000 years of their own education uh, seemed to serve them pretty well. So it's it's a very emotional day, and I think it's been turning a lot. Um, uh, in Melbourne, particularly, it's it's a very a very sensitive day. Where I, I'm not sure why Melbourne, particularly, but they don't really celebrate Australia Day here. They take the day off, uh, so it's a holiday. It's a public national holiday. So they take the day off, and they used to, used to sort of have you know, parades and whatever. The, the parades now are for Indigenous supporting Indigenous people, and um, you know, there's no no compensation. Not like the, in the US where the Indigenous Americans, Native Americans have had some form of compensation and treaty. With, they're still waiting for this in, here in Australia. They still haven't recognised them as, as ironically, or as humans. Uh, I know it's, it's hard to believe. It's just a simple word. They call it, oh, of course they do. Okay, we put on a piece of paper then. Right. Um, yeah, it was, right. a, it was, it was a no, no brainer. Just do it. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it's going to open up a whole can of it. Anyway. It, it goes on and goes on. And, and I think it's it, it, there's just some trace in this, in what we've seen at the moment with all the, you know, with the Djokovic and, and the lockdowns. Victoria here in Melbourne have been the most locked down city in the world. And now the pandemic's just hitting, of course. Um, I think minor version. I think maybe they've done the right thing because it's a Omicron thingy. But um, so I have this sense of uh, injustice or justice within me and I just don't like seeing people screwed over and the indigenous people are, have been screwed over so January 26th is uh, we'd love to celebrate I think everybody loves to celebrate Australia Australia Day a an Australian day but please don't put it on the day that the British came to stay there put it on January 27 or 28 or something. <laughs> right right but the Prime Minister will not even though it's overwhelming overwhelming support to change the date he won't change it well I change it from one week come on one week earlier, one week later, just right. do it. No, you won't do it. So it, it's there's an underlying sense of do what you're told here in Australia. Um, put it that way. It's it's uh, it's a very sensitive subject as it is right at the moment. With uh, of course with with Novak and all this stuff that's going on, it's like uh, you know they're they're bullies. Basically, the Australian government are bullies, uh, horrible bully, and. Uh, but is that what politicians do? Maybe it is. Yeah, well, you know, you got a little Chicago in your blood. Your mother's from Chicago. So yeah. you, know, you got that that whole politician in you deep down, right? You know, we're maybe, known, maybe. We're known as the Windy City, not because of the wind, but because oh, really? of the political system in Chicago. No, is that right? 100%. Has nothing no. to do with the cold and the wind. It no is way. Because of politics. Because of the, so, the hot wind coming out of their mouths. <laughs> So, so you, you got you got to check that out. So I see you being an ally, and and right now in America, there's this whole conversation around white allyship to indigenous people. They've even uh -huh. come up with an acronym for indigenous people, BIPOC, right? Black Indigenous People of Color. It's actually like in grant applications. It's in 
contract requirements, right? So, you know, America's going through this like reckoning, right. you know, reckoning of, you know, just sort of uh, awakening of how, you know, people of color or native, you know, we're, we're renaming the Washington Redskins to now the Washington Football Club, right? So we're sort yeah. of going through this awakening of how people, you know, different minorities have been treated over this time. So I find it, you know, you being a, a white Australian, right, speaking up for this is to me very similar, but, you know, forward thinking to like what they're now they're calling white allyship in America. Mm. Mm. Right. It's, it's, it's just interesting. Right. You don't see that a lot in tennis either. Right. So I commend you for it. But we talk about, uh, you know, the whole COVID-19 thing, the requirements, how hard it's been on tennis players. What do you think about, you know, what's going on with Novak? You know, in my eyes, I think of all of us as a very small family. Right. Yeah. You think about tennis has gotten smaller over the past few years because now you got a player plus two rule, right? So like mm. what, what used to be, you you get eight credentials, right? You find late, you get a bunch of credentials, bunch of tickets. Now it's like, yep, player plus two, player yeah. plus one. So we've become an even smaller family. Mm. And you would think we'd be able to manage these situations better internally. What do you think? Of, yeah. I don't have a view either way about how Novak is treated, but what what do you think that we, how we should handle this differently as a family? It's tricky, man, because I think what the WTA and ATP have done really well is to keep the tour going somehow. Um, I, I am not for their, their policies, some of their policies. Um, let's, let's put it, just put it that way. I think anybody should be free to make a choice on whether they vaccinate or not based on Based on the science and the research, there's no difference whatsoever. Nobody's in a harm for anybody. We've been, there's been unvaccinated and vaccinated players living together for the last two years. And there's never been any breakout, you know, disasters happening in the tour. We know that. We, we, it's, it's funny because the tennis almost, it's almost like a perfect scientific experiment to say, okay, how can people travel the world in a group? vaccinated unvaccinated traveling covid restrictions this and that let's can we get a group that we can study oh tennis players perfect let's go have a look at that where and, and different nationalities different colors the great thing about tennis is that you yeah, we're all a community we all look different we all have different everythings and yet we we we, we try we we get along we, we pretty much get along you know and i thought in actual fact the community got tighter last year and uh we all sort of helped each other you know it was coaches i didn't really know and i thought oh, i don't really know if he likes me that guy likes me or whatever <laughs> and players go you know whoever uh you know there's always you know i'm friendly to everybody but you know every, and they've been playing we'll be saying good morning hi how's it going you know and, and it was it was like let's make let's get through this let's get through this together and i think to a certain extent they've done a pretty good job at it um and I think that's why it's so shocking and it's been so, I don't think many people speak out uh, about this, but I damn well will. Um, <laughs> maybe it's a Chicago in me, but, you know, I think most of the players are horrified with what's happening to Novak. Absolutely horrified to think that, that this can happen to a superstar athlete, superhuman fitness machine to be sent out of Australia because of health risks. Anyway. I think one of the issues is, and one of the things that, that is, is that there's no players union to support him. There's an ATP tour, which is supposed to be a players union, but it's also so concerned about right, work, the tour. I mean, it's, got, it's hiring hundreds of thousands of people. And I understand that. That's their priorities to keep the tour going. And I, you know, I, I commend them for doing that in the WTA as well. But somebody has to stand up and say, enough of this is enough, enough's enough. I mean, the NCAA are now saying you know, vaccinated, unvaccinated players doesn't matter. Okay, they play. That's that was just announced a couple of days ago. Yeah, with some basketballers are doing the same thing. They can play some cities and not cities. Okay, let's let's get over that, please. But in tennis, there's nobody standing up to these bullies who are who are, who are forcing athletes to do certain things that they don't want to do. We need a players' union. And then ATP said, so we well, don't. That's need what Novak was trying to start, right? Irony, irony of irony. irony. Ironically, 
Isn't yeah. that the irony of ironies? Is that Novak for the last two years have been saying we need a players union? Well, I say we separated from the MIPTC, which is basically the International Tennis Federation. They run the Grand Slams and the Davis Cup. Mm -hmm. MIPTC. I remember the eight the, the ATP guys coming to me. I was one of the top players at the time. Mats Villan, Ed Berg, McEnroe, the guys at Lendl, and we all, and they said we want to branch off and do our own tour. Would you support us? Be like hell yeah. We, that, we want to have our own say in our own tour. Players don't have their own say in their own tour. They are, they've got on the board is three basically promoters, promoters, right. yeah. tournament promoters. That is, should not be part of a players' union, having a tour promoter. And, and I break it down crudely, but it's not far off, is we're a travelling circus. So if you're a rock band, if you're a Bon Jovi or whatever, You've got a manager, somebody manager, whatever, and they go over and say, right, who wants to who wants to hire, get Bon Jovi to come and play for it? The hands will go up. Yep, I'm a I'm a local tour promoter. I'll do all organising here in uh, here in Tamp Tampa or whatever. I'll do that there. Okay, I've got another guy in LA. I've got another guy in Berlin. Okay, they'll all do that. Right, and we'll manage we'll manage it. That's what the ATP do tour do now, uh, and they do a very good job at that. But they do not. They have don't have a proper say in their own union, and they're in their own tour. They need a players' union, absolutely. And the players' union would stand up to Novak and say, "No, this is absolutely ridiculous. There's zero science. You can fact check me. Zero science in putting an unvaccinated person sending them out of the country on health reasons. There is absolutely none. And the players' union should stand up and go, right, we're striking. That's the end of it." Australian Open's over. That's yeah. what should. That's that's what that's what could happen. And I, I'd be supported. I, all the play, all the legends I've talked to, Matt Spillian the other day, and Jimmy Connor and um, McEnroe, they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened to this? What happened to the ATP? You know, we don't have a say anymore. Um, you know, not that we have much of a say, but we are hundred percent. Not all of us. I don't have spoken to everybody, but all the ex players, legends I've spoken to, hundred percent behind a players union. And, and it's the right thing to do. The players' union can work with the ATP and make it happen. But if something big comes up, then they can stand up and say, yeah, that's not right. You can't force players to do something that they don't want to do in a medical thing issue. Um, and I don't care who the bully minister is. Uh, so that, I think, is a, is a, is a big is issue in tennis. And ironically, as you said, as we said, uh, Novak's the one who's trying to, trying to start it. And if, the, if it had come off, I think he would be in here playing. As it turns out, I, I don't think, as we stand right now, because um, we're having, I'm not sure when, the, when when's, the, when's this podcast coming out? Uh, um, probably after the fact. Well, uh, after. Well, but, after. But, okay. It'll, well, it'll I be might be wrong. To see. It'll be interesting to see, but here we are on a Friday night. Make an announcement Friday night. He's supposed to play Monday. It's the weekend. All the courts are closed. Courts, as in. Uh, Magistrate well, courts to, to protest to, to, for him to put a claim, uh, the, uh, and, and, it, and it won't be Monday. And then by that time, he'll be uh, supposed to be on, on the on the court. So I can't see I can't see it happening. And it's I think it's just a tragedy for tennis. It's embarrassment for Australia, and and it's disappointing. Um, but I'll tell you what, he'll be fired up to win another Slam. Gee, the French Open and Wimbledon, he's going to be so fired up to win that. So uh, I don't think we've seen the end of Novak by any means. Well, that'll be interesting to see. I mean, who would have thought that the draw would be made, his name be in the draw, and us still be 50-50 on whether or not he's actually going to walk on the court. That that yeah. This is a first. Yeah. This yeah. First. It's a lot of firsts this year, isn't it? I mean, we see his qualifier, Raducanu, come from the qualifying to win the USA. Can you believe that? I mean, that's yeah, one of the greatest I mean, stories I've ever I seen. gave her – so I had a 125 in Chicago three weeks before the Open in which she didn't get in my draw. I gave her a wild card into the 125. No. She gets to the final, loses to another 18-year-old, Clara Tolson, which is interesting how the 18-year-olds lose to the 18-year-olds, but they beat all the 26-year-olds. And then yeah. she goes on, gets, makes the qualies of the U.S. Open, and then wins the whole thing. I was like, hey, you know, you should, I, you should give me like a little bonus because, you know, I helped your swing get off to a good start <laughs> with, with that wild card. You got a wild card. You got five good matches, got to the final. Would end confident to the qualifier and won the won the Grand Slam. Like, hey, 
send me a couple grand, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Throw me a bone. We, yeah, no. I, I, it's, well, I mean, it's just there's some unbelievable stories in in sport and and in, in the world, and uh, you know, we need some of those uplifting the stories. She doesn't hit the ball big, right? Nothing really like sort of to hurt you. So mm -hmm. I would say, having watched her in person for five matches, I was shocked that she could make it through seven matches in two weeks. Well, okay, so. When people hear this, this will be, let's have a bit of fun. When people hear this, the first of the tournament will be whatever through. So she plays Sloan first round. Yes. And then, yes. We practice with both of them, but last, last two days. <laughs> so who do you think is going to win this match? And, and when this comes out, we're one of us, we might have egg on our face, but <laughs> I, I take Sloan. Three and four. I, I, I give I give Radakanu seven games. I don't care how you want it. Five and two, two and five, three and four, four and three, six and one. I give yeah. her seven games. Only right. because of the way that Sloan hits the ball. I think that the weight of that ball will give Radakanu or should give Radakanu and her small frame trouble above her shoulders. Now. Sloan didn't play a tune up. I was at her wedding January 1st. Yeah. Right? So, so that's a, that's the wild card into it. Cause maybe she hasn't had enough matches. Maybe she doesn't have the confidence going in, but aside from that, Sloan should beat her up. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. Yeah. Cause we, we noticed that today Sloan's forehand is a big forehand. Oh my goodness gracious. She can thump that ball. And about, I mean, back all the shots. She's moving really well. She looked fit today, effortlessly around the court, and Q was playing really well, and Sloan was just floating around the court. Uh, we, we said the same thing. We said the same thing. So let's see if all three of us have got egg on our face. Uh, I, I, said that to, I said that to Q. I said, who do you think's going to – you played the two girls the last two days. Just coincidence. We booked them in, and they end up playing each other. I said, who do you think's going to win out of that match? And she said, it's Sloan. She didn't even hesitate. So – but – you know, it's match, as you said, this it's different thing when you got the crowd and you got the matches and uh well, well let so me we'll ask see. you this question. You've seen Radikanu on court up close and personal, you've seen her ball, you probably have been behind her ball, having to stop a ball in the corner or something. How hmm. do you think a player like that wins a grand slam? How did that happen? It is, uh, it's a fen phenomenal story. I mean, she yeah, she she played. Just unbelievable tennis, didn't she? She served big, hit the forehand, was consistent. Her backhand was was attacking. She's a she's got a lot of control. She got a lot of control. A lot got of a really control. good slice, really good slice backhand. Got a very good drop shot and volley. She's got the whole package. It'd be interesting to see. She had three coaches in the last four, three or four months or four months, and every coach has a sort of different theory, slightly, um, you know, on on things. It'd be interesting to see if it matches up with um, Torben, who, of course, worked with uh, Kerber for many, many, many years. And who else did he work with recently? I, uh, Donna Vekic. Donna Vekic. Right, that's right. So it'd be interesting to see if that works because, um, yeah, it'd just be interesting to, to see where it works. So certainly the, the personality-wise and everything else. Um, but there's a lot of pressure on the girl, you know? I mean, there's, you know... I'm not going to say it was a fluke because I don't think so. I think she she fully does. It's not a fluke when you get through a whole tournament and don't lose a set. That's not yeah. a fluke. That That's is, not a fluke. That is, that is something pretty pretty damn special. I mean, yeah. it, it was phenomenal. It was I, and even to this day, because I was of course commentating for the BBC back in the UK, and I just kept shaking my head. I said, I cannot believe this. She's playing unbelievable oh. tennis. Unbelievable. She's playing like Serena, but she's never been heard of before. I mean. You know, it's, it, 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 you got to give her credit. She hit, did everything really well. So, you know, it, it'll come back even though, it's, you know, if, if she's a little bit of a shaky spot, she's, she's, a, she's a great story. What a story that is. And that's a, that's a story of sport for, oh, just about for the last 10 years. I mean, how does a girl qualifying win the U.S. Open? I know, right? I mean, it's insane. <laughs> it, it's, it's truly, but she gets behind the ball well. She doesn't hit the ball big. She doesn't really move the ball to me and put herself in a position to have to defend any crazy angles. She mm. kind of keeps the ball kind of straight ahead, which keeps the match through the middle of the court, mm. right? 
doesn't move it, so that means she doesn't have to cover. Um, but I think mm -hmm. the weight of her ball um, is well below the weight of the ball we see from a, some of the past champions, the Sabalenka. You know, Halep didn't hit the ball big, but the ball got something on it, right? Uh, Kvitova, Madison, um, even Angie. You know, the, the, the weight of her ball to me is well below those players. But I think the way that she kept the game compact, like you said, she was always under control. She kept mm. the whole ball, the game, the geometry very narrow, mm. which I think helped her. And I think that's how she won it. Yeah. That's um, a, a great performance. I mean, it's, uh, so that's exciting news for the, for, for women's tennis. I mean, uh, she's a mega star, of course, in the UK, um, uh, you know, here and you know, this, I couldn't go five feet. Uh, and it, when I was in London there that people wouldn't stop me. And, and I want to ask the question, what I thought of Radicani, I said, she just won the US Open. <laughs> she can retire. Right, that's right. It. It's over. She's and she's British. Yeah, and you all have been like longing for a British Grand Slam champion forever, yeah. right? Poor, yeah. um, what's my girl's name? Kanta. Poor Kanta had like the weight of the world on her for a long time, right? Yeah, yeah um, that's right. Virginia that's Wade, 1976 or something in that US Open. I mean, it, it's an amazing story. It's and, and it's there's, I mean, Ashley Barty, of course, we're very proud of her here, and she's just becoming better and better player. Yeah, uh, you know, I think she's the favorite here. The Australian Open. Hopefully, by the time this comes out, she hasn't lost. Um, <laughs> but she's. Um, you know, it's been like forty some years that there's been an Aussie female Grand Slam champion, though. You know, a, 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 a Australian Open Aussie. Yeah, champion. yeah, like that must be must have been uh, Yvonne Gulagon, was it, or Margaret Court? Must be one of those two. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's legends of the game. You know, the men's, of course, is really interesting. If Novak's not playing, uh, boy, is that is Varev. Is Varev's the next one in line, isn't he? Uh, whether he's, he can, he's not. Yeah, he's, yeah. He, you know, he will, him and Medvedev, you yeah. know, when the big three move on, I think they'll dominate the game. And team, you know, team is kind of missing right now, so we're kind of forgetting about him. But he's yeah. in that mix, too, of, like, the next wave of yeah. big three. Yeah. Uh, they, they'll never get 20, right? But... You know, they're the next big three. Medvedev, they're a team. Yeah, um, it's a pass. It's a pass. Uh, it's a pass. Alcaraz, Alcaraz is going to be a heck of a player. He's I mean, he's already be. a heck of a player. It, yeah. It's a big ball. I mean, Rafa's still there. You know, how he, I don't know how his body can hold up uh, all that through through five, six tough matches. We'll have to wait and see. But um, yeah, it's, it's a look without Novak. It's uh, going to certainly be a weakened tournament without team. It's going to be a weakened tournament without Federer. It's going to be, Slightly different look now, isn't it? But yep. uh, that's that's why that's the way it's going to have to be. Well, we're going to see, man. Well, we we've got a good prediction. We've got something to check up on when this comes out. We'll see if me, you, and Q have egg on our face with that that first round match. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, Pat, I got to thank you, man, for taking so much time. I know you're down under. It's nighttime where I am. It's afternoon where you are. I know you're getting ready. Uh, good luck. Coco's a tough out, but I'm you know I'm sure you study up. So, man, I want to thank you for taking the time. Always a pleasure. My funny story about you is Coco always used to make fun of you and your bag of pills, right? So, so you, so you would go and work out. Oh, there it is. There it is. I got three bags of pills here. <laughs> there it is, right? so, so you would come to the, to the cafeteria in a full sweat, right? You'd be sweating more than Coco. Sloan would say to me, come out, look at him. He's an old man and he's working out. You need to work out too. And I said, well, I, I got to make sure you work out. I got to stand right beside you to make sure you work out so I can't work out. So th <laughs> that's my, you said, I'm a lot of, I feel old. That's my Pat Cash old story with you putting me to shame because you actually go to the site and use the gym like you're still playing and you got your bag of supplements, right? <laughs> to keep that that's my funny story for you that's 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 me in a nutshell yeah hobbling around like an old man but still going for it <laughs> but man keep going man you like i said you're a trendsetter and uh you, know, you brought a lot to a game even if this current regime doesn't know what you brought to the game a lot of what they do you started so thank you for being you and i will see you soon probably 
Okay, brother. It'll be fantastic. Thanks for your time, mate, as well. Thank you, guys. This has been the Tennis.com podcast with the legend Pat Cash. Thank you guys for listening.